Okay, so let's continue our discussion of Richard Parker uh, and his importance uh, in relation to Pi's survival. Uh, so in chapter 48, we actually learn the origins of the name Richard Parker. Very odd name for a tiger to have. Uh, very human sounding name uh, for a tiger to have. And this is one of those instances in the novel where the kind of lines between human and animal get mixed up or blurred. Um, we saw that with anthropomorphism as well, uh, so how animals are given human characteristics. But in this case, we have a tiger, and because of a clerical er error uh, when they were filing, um, the clerk accidentally wrote in the hunter's name rather than the tiger's name uh, when they were going through the file. So. Richard Parker was captured by the hunter, uh, or the, sorry, the hunter Richard Parker caught two tigers, a mother and a cub, um, and then the hunter's name was Richard Parker, but in a clerical error, the names kind of got switched, so uh, the hunter's name, Richard Parker, was written down in where they were supposed to write the tiger's name down, and then the tiger's name, which was supposed to be thirsty uh, because the little tiger cub was very thirsty and went to the water to drink. Um, so that was recorded as the hunter's name. Uh, so there was a little bit of mix up clerical error and the tiger ended up being named Richard Parker after the hunter. Uh, so interesting little mix up, a little detail there uh, where you have uh, names being shuffled around or changed uh, and uh, a human name given to uh, an animal, in this case, to our Bengal tiger. Um, this little detail sort of, it becomes more important later and uh, sort of reiterates uh, some of the sort of themes or uh, even foreshadows some events or some revelations uh, near the end of the novel. Um, but Richard Parker's presence uh, does have a significant role to play in Pi's survival and uh, we can see how at first Pi is conflicted. He's in crisis uh, and he doesn't know how he's going to survive aboard the lifeboat uh, with a man-eating Bengal tiger aboard the boat as well. Um, so at first he, he tries to come up with a plan uh, to kill Richard Parker and he goes through various uh, sort of scenarios, plans, uh, trying to think of a way uh, in order to uh, get the job done, so to speak. Uh, so he goes through sort of multiple ideas or scenarios, trying to figure out what's the best way of uh, eliminating the tiger, because it is kind of a, his biggest obstacle at this point to surviving. Uh, so on page or chapter 54, he goes through various kind of strategies or plans. So plan one, push him off the lifeboat. Uh, not a very good plan, right? <laughs> so you think of this 450 pound uh, tiger, uh, Pi has no chance really of making that a reality. So he can't just go and push a tiger off uh, the lifeboat. Um, because he's already seen Richard Parker swim as well. So tigers can swim, um, so he could easily just pull himself back up onto the boat if he wanted and then kill Pi. <laughs> so it's not a very good plan. Uh, so that one gets scratched off the list. Plan number two, uh, kill him with six morphine syringes. So uh, there are morphine syringes as part of the uh, supplies that are available on the life raft that he finds along with the water and the manual and uh, the oars and all that kind of stuff. So there are uh, syringes there. So if he, he thinks that if he can sort of get all six of them at once injected into Richard Parker, then maybe that would be enough uh, morphine to kill him. Um, but he considers this plan to be, you know, in, uh, not feasible based on, um, you know, he, w he won't uh, have the time or the ability to uh, get six injections one after another uh, to inject the tiger with the morphine. 
Um, so that one is scratched off the list as well. And plan number three, attack him with all available weaponry. Uh, he says, nope, this one's ludicrous. Uh, I, I was a puny, feeble vegetarian. What does he know about weaponry and attack? Uh, so Pi acknowledges his weaknesses here, right? He's grown up. Uh, he's still a you know young man in his you know teens. Uh, he's been a vegetarian his whole life, so he's not even a meat eater. Um, so how is he expected to know how to kill an animal, let alone this giant tiger? So he recognizes that um, there is no way that he's going to be able to uh, physically uh, confront the tiger in any way to assert his authority or to kill the animal. Uh, so that one is uh, scratched off the list as well. Plan number four, choke him. Uh, he said, I had a rope. If I stayed at the bow and got the rope to go around the stern and a noose to go around his neck, I could pull the rope while he pulled to get at me uh, and he could choke himself. Um, but that one also, he sort of scratches off the list uh, because it's sort of a suicidal plan. He sees this as being, uh, you know, much could go wrong. The rope could, you know, break or he could sort of reach and uh, strangle pie or claw pie. Uh, plan number five, poison him, set him on fire, electro electrocute him. How? With what? So there's just not enough uh, supplies, I guess, on board um, the ship to kill him in any of these other ways. Uh, plan number six, wage a war of attrition. All I had to do was let the unforgiving laws of nature run their course and I would be saved. Wait for Richard Parker basically to starve or uh, die of thirst um, and then just outlive him, outlast him. Uh, so this is sort of Pi's only hope, I guess, uh, for uh, over or outliving um, Richard Parker uh, and killing him. So he doesn't see any other way to get rid of Richard Parker rather than just trying to outlive him, um, letting him waste away through time and starvation and dehydration. Um, but even that he discovers is, you know, just a waste of his time uh, and it's not a real, uh, realistic uh, strategy because, you know, tigers uh, have, you know, the ability to go, you know, a lot longer than a human without food or water um, and there is, you know, the strength of, of natural will of animals to survive is often much stronger. Uh, then we give it credit for. Uh, yeah, so on page 177, he acknowledges that it's a ridiculous idea. He's an idiot for even thinking that he could outlast or outlive uh, the tiger and that it's the worst plan of all. Uh, so he's really just grasping at straws at this point, trying to think of a way for him to, you know, survive aboard uh, against all these odds. Um, and really, one of the greatest obstacles he has to overcome is his own fear of uh, death. And, um, you know, that, that it's going to be an obstacle, an inner obstacle, an inner conflict within himself uh, to overcome his fear and to keep struggling for life. Uh, so, in a way, Richard Parker ends up being uh, a kind of a, actually a positive influence or impact on his life because it is a distraction and he has all this inner fear um, and doubt within him that he could survive on his own so in a way Richard Parker does give him a maybe uh, some companionship some a distraction something to think about that's not uh, his the death of his family or he doesn't give in to despair because he's got other things on his mind namely Richard Parker uh, so he finally acknowledges uh, this important role that the tiger is going to play in his mind um, in terms of his survival. Uh, and he says so on page 179, so this is chapter 57. 
Uh, so he says, it was Richard Parker who calmed me down. It is the irony of the story that the one who scared me witless to start with was the very same who brought me peace, purpose, I dare say even wholeness. Uh, so if you look at that line um, specifically, those three words, peace, purpose, and wholeness, uh, those are the three things that the tiger is going to bring Pi. Um, so peace of mind, uh, distraction, uh, a, a purpose in his time, uh, and a sense of wholeness. So before Richard Parker, he was incomplete or uh, he's lost his whole family. So there's a new sense of wholeness that he gains from his relationship with the tiger. So first he fears him, but then he learns to rely on, uh, even depend on Richard Parker for his very existence. So his survival hinges on Richard Parker. Uh, and there's sort of turning points in the growth of their relationship. So he definitely moves from being or wanting to kill Richard Parker to uh, acknowledging that he needs Richard Parker to survive. So there's a big jump or leap or turning point in that um, understanding of his own survival. Uh, so there's one thing, you know, he doesn't even worse than, you know, losing Richard Parker or killing the tiger is his loneliness and fear. Um, so I think the presence of the tiger also kind of fills this gap or hole within himself uh, for the loss and his loneliness. Um, so there is a need for a companion uh, in this situation. Otherwise, he would have probably given up uh, much earlier um, in his survival. So I'm going to have us uh, think about um, the growth or the sort of events that transpire um, that lead to Richard Parker and Pi becoming stronger. So what are some of the events that happen uh, between Richard Parker and Pi to strengthen their relationship and build their sort of partnership uh, in a way? Um, okay, so let's take a look at some of the uh, key events in their friendship. So the first event that occurs that definitely changes the dynamics between Richard Parker and Pi is, well, I guess the first one could be the death of the hyena. Um, so Richard Parker killing the hyena uh, definitely uh, it not om only eliminates their common enemy, the hyena in this case, it also sort of brings uh, the two of them uh, as the two sole survivors uh, of this accident. Um, so another turning point would be uh, when Pi starts feeding Richard Parker. Uh, so the first animal uh, that Pi feeds Richard Parker is the rat. And uh, so he grabs this little rat that crawls along the tarp and and Pi throws it at Richard Parker and Richard Parker catches it in his mouth. Uh, so this is sort of the first instance that Pi realizes that, hey, maybe I can make this work somehow. Uh, maybe it's possible to establish a kind of relationship, uh, master an animal almost like a circus trainer would train its tigers. Maybe we can uh, create a dynamic of um, sort of ownership uh, or mastery uh, between himself and the tiger and tame the tiger, essentially. So the rat is uh, one of those key moments where Pi is, is sort of thinking strategically and and learning uh, how to control the situation. Um, another one is uh, Richard Parker making the Proustian noise. Uh, so he does make this interesting cat noise. Uh, it's kind of a, a snorting, a huffing uh, that large cats uh, do uh, to show that they're not um, to acknowledge that there's no threat uh, with the other animal. Um, so they make this noise out of sort of kind, you know, gentle gesture uh, to show that they're not a threat. And um, it's sort of a friendly gesture, right? So they would make it to uh, another 
animal to show that they weren't uh, going to attack or anything. So the Proustian is kind of this major turning point in their relationship where they're sort of, a, Richard Parker is acknowledging that Pi's not a threat to him um, and there's a, a sort of codependency relationship beginning uh, between the two of them. So after Richard Parker makes the Proustian noise, um, Pi fully decides at this point that he's going to tame Richard Parker. Uh, so he makes this uh, decision on page 181. Uh, so he says, I had to tame him. It was at that moment that I realized this necessity. It was not a question of him or me, but of him and me. We were literally and figuratively in the same boat. We would live or we would die together. We, he might be killed in an accident or he could die shortly of natural causes, but it would be foolish to count on such an eventuality. More likely the worst would happen, the simple passage of time in which the animal toughness would easily outlast my human frailty. Only if I tame him could I possibly trick him into dying first, if we had to come to that sorry business. So Pi acknowledges that, you know, if he can tame Richard Parker, then maybe uh, they could survive together. Um, and it's not a matter of him and me, it's him and me, right? So the two have a kind of wholeness or togetherness uh, that is going to be essential to both their survival. Um, and then he says, he acknowledges as much on page 181, 182, where he says, uh, there's more to it, I will come clean, I will tell you a secret. A part of me was glad about Richard Parker. A part of me did not want Richard Parker to die at all, because if he died, I would be left alone with despair, a foe even more formidable than a tiger. If I still had the will to live, it was thanks to Richard Parker. He kept me from thinking too much about my family and my tragic circumstances. He pushed me to go on living. I hated him for it, yet at the same time, I was grateful. I am grateful. It's the plain truth. Without Richard Parker, I wouldn't be alive today to tell you my story. So there's a large truth uh, in that um, passage where Pi acknowledges that the key to his survival at all is Richard Parker. So he's acknowledging that, you know, without Richard Parker, he wouldn't be alive today. Um, so he wouldn't have survived without him. And partially it is, you know, he doesn't want to acknowledge or realize the loneliness, his despair of, lo of loss. Uh, so Richard Parker is sort of a distraction for his mind, uh, so he doesn't dwell on the horrible things that have happened to him, the tragedy of his family's deaths. Uh, so it is a kind of mental preoccupation. Um, if he can stay focused on Richard Parker, he doesn't have to think about the bad things that have happened. Um, we uh, also see how Pi begins a kind of almost like a circus trainer and his li uh, tiger, um, that kind of dynamic, so a kind of master or asserting himself as the top or alpha animal and then trying to create Richard Parker as the omega animal, uh, so one that is dependent on uh, the alpha. So he's kind of creating the hierarchy or trying to establish that animal hi hierarchy that um, a circus trainer would do in the ring. Uh, so he has everything at his disposal but the, that he needs. So he sees the lifeboat itself as kind of a circus ring. He is going to be the circus trainer. He's got a whistle uh, that he's going to use to start uh, training the tiger. Uh, and, uh, and he's going to use the waves uh, that make Richard Parker seasick as another way to sort of control him. So he's got everything he sort of needs in order to establish a uh, control or domination uh, over Richard Parker. Um, and they're going to sort of start working together uh, and creating a bond of trust. Um, another thing that Pi will do is to mark his own territory. Uh, so he, he uses the language of the animal, which is urine. Uh, so you think about how animals mark their territory by peeing on things. You know, if you ever take your dog for a walk and he pees on every tree around the block, that's what they're doing. They're marking their territory. So Richard Parker's lower part of the life raft is all uh, smells like his urine. So he's marked out his territory, but Pi's going to do the same with his urine. Uh, so he 
fills a beaker, um, a glass beaker with his urine and sort of sprinkles it around uh, the, the top of the tarp and over the safety lockers uh, where the food is. Um, so he's really got to mark his um, space. And he's also created the secondary raft um, as his own space as well. So that's his sort of safe uh, area. Um, so he has, he's using all the lessons that his sort of father has told him uh, growing up about animals and territori territori territoriality um, and all those kind of uh, animal lessons about zoo enclosures. And he's kind of recreating that uh, while he's on the life raft. Um, and then another instance is uh, when Richard Parker is struck by the flying fish. Uh, so Pi will start fishing and feeding Richard Parker uh, and this will set up their kind of dependency um, and uh, he takes on kind of almost like the zookeeper's role uh, for caring for Richard Parker, this wild animal. Um, so fish and feeding will become a large part of uh, the care and dependency that he creates uh, with the tiger. Uh, so that instance uh, of the flying fish will become one where uh, Pi starts, you know, he, he, he's starting to learn uh, to take care of himself uh, by fishing, something that he would never thought he'd be able to do. He's a little vegetarian, you know, boy growing up, so he had never fished before in his life, never even killed um, a living creature before, so he, he's going to have to do things um, to feed himself and feed Richard Parker, uh, so he'll become himself a a expert uh, fisher hunter, and uh, in a way he becomes a better killer uh, in trying to feed Richard Parker and himself. Um, he's also struck at that moment when you know just by how how amazing Richard Parker is when he catches the fish and he's almost in awe at how magnificent uh, Richard Parker is as well. So he does appreciate uh, how beautiful and strong and um, uh, amazing, I guess, Richard Parker is as one of God's creatures. So there's an appreciation uh, between them. And let's see, any other instances? Um, there's sort of, uh, there's other instances where, uh, boundaries are formed between, uh, Richard Parker and Pi. Um, he starts cleaning up after Richard Parker and almost keeps it like a zoo enclosure. Um, he'll sniff Richard Parker's feces, uh, and... Uh, hiding his waste, uh, so he kind of creates these these uh, uses um, the territory and almost creates uh, this deference or respect for his uh, role as sort of the caretaker of the animal, and shows his mastery uh, and superiority over Richard Parker in that instance, um, and then. Uh, Richard, or uh, Pi will start feeding uh, Richard Parker. Um, the, he catches him a giant Dorado and feeds him that. Uh, so there is all these instances where the bond between uh, Richard Parker and Pi will grow and uh, evolve and change. Um, but they grow closer. And I think the important thing is that, uh, you know, without one another, they, neither one would have survived. So we do get that strong sense that they rely and uh, depend on each other for survival.